next panel, which will consist of a, a number of speakers, is called Selecting the Refugees in Southeast Asia. Uh, the movement of 60,000 people from camps in Southeast Asia to Canada in 1979 to 1980 began with the efforts of a surprisingly small group of young Canadian visa officers stationed in Thailand, Singapore, Manila, and Hong Kong. What they did and how they did it is the subject of our next panel. The logistics of the movement was entrusted to the Intergovernmental Committee of European Migration, which we know today as the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, and we're fortunate to have on this particular panel a former visa officer, uh, Scott Reed, uh, who recently retired from the I IOM. Our chair for this afternoon is Scott Mullins. Scott served as a for in the Foreign Service for 19 years. He was involved in the Hai Hong operation and spent two years in Hong Kong at the height of the refugee movement. His career included an assignment in Beirut, Nairobi, and Tehran, and included assignments as a senior trade commissioner and spokesperson for the Foreign Affairs Department. And he's currently the vice president for the uh, Committee to Relations with TD Bank. And I think Scott is now famous in that photograph uh, that you saw as part of the slide deck that Mike presented. And I think the title of that that appears on the CBC website is the One Man Tribunal. So we'll turn things over to the One Man Tribunal. Thank you very much. Uh, well, in fact, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six person tribunal this afternoon. And it, I guess our opportunity to share with you uh, some of the stories of uh, the immigration or visa officers who were in the field, and as well our colleague from uh, uh, ISOM at the time, but IOM today who helped uh, so enormously with the logistics in moving people. So uh, the f I'm going to start um, quick introductions as we go down the, the way. So maybe we can start with uh, Dave Ritchie, just where you were, and then we'll get back to you with um, comments. Hello, I'm uh, David Ritchie, and I was in Singapore, which covers the area of Air Malaysia and Indonesia, and I was there between 1979 and 81. My name is Don Cameron. I had two kicks at this can. I was in the embassy in Saigon in April 1975 on loan from the visa office in Hong Kong. And, and then again, I went to Singapore in 1979, where I also worked in Malaysia and Indonesia till 1981. My name is Murray Obertshauser, and like Don, I had two chances to do this. I worked in 75. I ran or was involved in the East Coast movement from the U.S., and then I opened the program in Thailand, and uh, where we processed about 13,000 people in 18 months. We'll be back for that. I'm Joyce Cavanaugh Wood. I worked in Hong Kong, Guam, Wake and Camp Pendleton in 1975, and then in 1987, worked on the family reunification program for Vietnam out of Bangkok. I'm Dick Scott. I uh, started work with uh, ICEM in Thailand in 1976. Worked there for a while, then I went back in 1978 to um, Hong Kong was there, and then again in Thailand, 79 and 80. So as you can see, you have, uh, we have a breadth of experience and a lot of gray hair here as we uh, start this afternoon's uh, discussion. Um, I th our format will be to um, have uh, uh, sort of a little bit of storytelling from each one of the uh, participants on the panel. Um, then I'll throw out some themes and uh, perhaps some uh, questions to get conversation going and amongst the, the panel. And then uh, we'll uh, have a q and A. I'm, I'm going to be ruthless panelists. Uh, I have my watch off and sitting on front of me, and we're going to sort of you know hope that everyone can do their thing in less than eight minutes. That's the plan. And I will uh, will cut you off appropriately. So as I think you heard, we have people that started um, really before the movement itself started. And so uh, we had a quick conversation and thought we would start off uh, first with um, with Joyce. Uh, to tell a little bit about um, her involvement for in the early days. So, please. Thank you. Uh, on May 8, 1975, I arrived in Hong Kong from Ottawa. I had been working at headquarters, but I was uh, 
assigned to go to Hong Kong, where I expected to be working in the refugee camps to deal with those who had recently fled. Uh, I arrived in Hong Kong to go to a, a camp which was at that time underwater in my memory. It was uh, a very sad place. Uh, the monsoon season had, uh, had arrived and the uh, situation was, was quite nasty. So I didn't last long there. Uh, it was decided that I would be shipped off to Guam because given the uh, monsoon conditions, it was decided that uh, things in, in Hong Kong had to be wound down rather than spooled up. So off I went to Guam, not knowing exactly where Guam was or what to expect. When I arrived there, there was a small team uh, already in place. Uh, we had a full range of uh, visa officers, a medical officer, uh, security officer. We even had uh, with us the person who actually had locked up the embassy in, in Saigon, and he served as our communicator. We worked uh, at a, a, a base which was organized by the U.S. military. It was an enormous tent city. It was hot. It was dusty. Uh, it was uh, vast, never-ending. Never uh, and we worked out of a little trailer, which was always dusty and always noisy. And there were people just lined up and lined up and lined up. Uh, we had to have interpreters, so we chose our interpreters from our client base, basically. We just went out and said, okay, who speaks English and who speaks French? Uh, we would pull people out of the line. They would work for us until we got them to a point where uh, they were ready themselves to go, and then we would put them on a plane to Canada and then start the process all over again. So we were... Um, recruiting interpreters as well as, as recruiting refugees at the time. Um, one of the interpreters that worked for us was a Miss Lien, who had been our receptionist in uh, Saigon. And she, with her two sisters, had managed to find their way to Guam. I might say no thanks to the Canadian embassy. Uh, and uh, so she worked for us for a little bit. And then I, was, I very happily ran into her about a year later when I checked into my doctor's office in uh, Ottawa, and there she was, working as his receptionist. So I was very pleased to see that she had landed on her feet, despite when I saw her in the camp being very worried about uh, the relatives that she had left behind. So um, how, what was our living situation there? Well, we were all housed, uh, the visa officers, the medical officer, everybody, plus two typists from Hong Kong. We were all living in a kind of a condo affair because there was not a lot of uh, places that we could live. And after we worked all day uh, interviewing, then we went back to the condo at night, and that was our office. And so in the evenings, we had to type up the visas. Uh, I think we had two typewriters, as I recall. We had to type up the transportation loans, the manifests. This all took until about 11 o'clock at night. And then, of course, somebody had to go out to the airport because, as Mike mentioned or somebody mentioned earlier, there was always the night flight. Not always, but many, many times, about every three days, it seems to me, there was a flight. And so somebody had to go out to the airport armed with the manifest and then count everybody on the plane to make sure that there were enough people on the plane and the numbers matched. This was always a great problem because inevitably there was a baby that was in some mother's arms that you couldn't find or somebody had gone to the washroom or some child was under a seat somewhere. So one count never did it. There was always more than one that had to be done. It was a very hard working team. We, uh, we took no time basically for anything else other than work. It was just fill the planes, get the people on there, um, do your job and uh, know, that you, know that you had to get it done quickly because the monsoon was coming, guess where, to Guam. So uh, while I was on Guam, it turned out there was a, a small gaggle of people, uh, Vietnamese, on the island of Wake. Now how they got there, I have no idea, but they were destined to Canada. And so uh, once again, I drew the short straw and was put on a C-130 to Wake. And if you think Guam is nowhere, let me tell you that Wake is double nowhere. Uh, if you haven't been there, don't put it on your agenda. There, it's an airstrip. That's all it is. So uh, I went, uh, courtesy of the U.S. military, in a big empty C-130, uh, flew for five hours, got off the plane, 
uh, loaded up this group of people. I, I have a memory of 25 families, but uh, honestly, I wouldn't rely on my memory. Uh, anyway, a, a goodly number, uh, put them on the plane, and then my job was, during the five-hour flight back, to ensure that as many as possible had their uh, forms filled in so that when they landed, then we, they could participate in the finalized processing and get them on, on another plane to Canada. Uh, after about three weeks on Guam, then uh, the monsoon season once again coming, so uh, people were now being sent to bases in the United States. And um, there were several, but I was told that I was going to Camp Pendleton. And once again, I really didn't know where it was, but somebody said it was between San Diego and Los Angeles, and off I went. Um, by this time, I'm pretty tired. But I did uh, take probably the most exotic air flight of my entire existence uh, on a small Continental Airlines plane. We did um, uh, truck, Ponape, Kwajalein, Majuro, Johnston Island, and Hawaii before landing uh, on the west coast of the US. These islands, of course, uh, meant nothing to me at the time, but it was only in retrospect that I figured out how important they were uh, in the Second World War. So I arrived uh, in San Diego, was met, and taken to Camp Pendleton. Um, the first thing that I noticed was how cold it was in California. I, who had always thought California was warm, but after the tropics of, uh, of Guam, uh, it was really quite chilly. In any case, we were housed very well. We had a very nice trailer. Uh, the refugees were much better housed than they were on Guam. Uh, more stable tent facilities. Uh, there were enough toilet facilities for everybody, which had been an issue on Guam. Um, and we actually didn't have to work as frantically as we had uh, on Guam because we had enough people. The operation was nominally managed from Los Angeles, and um, we, we had a rotation of people from headquarters and from inland offices and so on, so we were fine. Um, and we um, encountered our, our American colleagues from time to time, and I'm happy to say that I met my husband in a refugee camp because he was working for US immigration. So if there's one good thing that came out of the war, it is that I met my husband. Um, I, I then returned to Ottawa, and many, many years later, I was posted in Bangkok, and at that point, I got to meet the parents and grandparents, and in some cases, brothers and sisters, of uh, those who had migrated earlier, because I was in charge of the family reunification program from Vietnam, and that meant traveling to Ho Chi Minh City to interview people who were um, related to those who had already come before, and who were now uh, well enough uh, able to sponsor the relatives whom they had left behind. And that's my story. And a good one. Fair, right on. Oh, perfect. <clears throat> Mr. Cameron, you are next. Thank you, Ambassador Malloy. <laughs> <laughs> You may have gathered already from what has been said and probably from previous experience that this program uh, was eventually, I mean, we're talking about from 1975, but by the time the large quota numbers began to, to come, was quite well handled from Ottawa from, from the point of view of those of us who are out there at the pointy end. Um, and there is no doubt in my mind that Michael Molloy was the right man in the right place at the right time and that I can't think of anybody else who could have did, done his job as well as he did. So we all owe a great vote of thanks to him for that. Now, I was in Saigon in April 1975. I was there because the visa office in Singapore, which was the one we had responsible for Vietnam, consisted of only one visa officer. He had gone into Saigon on April the 4th with all of his 
active Vietnam applications for permanent residence, which wasn't too many, but he took them with him to try to contact the, the people and to process their applications. Um, after he had been there for a while, uh, we, the management realized that he needed to go back to his one-person office, uh, and uh, I was sent from the visa office in Hong Kong to replace him. Now, what we were doing was, on the one hand, dealing with the expectations of these small Vietnamese community in Canada who had submitted sponsorships at their local immigration office for over 10,000 people. Uh, on the other hand, we were dealing with a situation where you couldn't get out of Vietnam unless you had an exit permit and a passport, a Vietnamese exit permit and a passport. The Vietnamese government was not issuing exit permits except in very few cases. Even with vast amounts of money and connections, it was almost impossible to get an exit permit if you were of draft age, for example. So I saw very few people that I could actually issue visas to. Uh, most of them were uh, young people. I don't remember any males. I think they were all young women who had exit permits to go to study in Canada. So we, we were able to issue, we issued ministers permits so that they could be, their status could be adjusted on arrival in Canada to permanent residence. The uh, situation was really a great waste of our time. I spent most of my day in the lobby of the embassy uh, with a great crowd of people surging around me saying, sans passeport et sans visa de sortie, il n'y a rien à faire. If you don't have a passport and an exit permit, we can't help you. So the, the question which, of course, always arises is, well, why didn't we try to help these 11,000 people get out of Vietnam um, illegally without going through the exit permit procedure? Uh, I had been in Vietnam only a few days before I realized that you know, this wasn't going to, to be possible, and, and anybody who thinks that we could have done it needs to go on to that well-known historical resource, YouTube, and look <coughs> at a old video clip of a, a Walter Cronkite broadcast uh, on CBS News, where they had a CBS film crew on a chartered aircraft that against US government advice had flown from Saigon to Da Nang as Da Nang was falling. Even Air America wouldn't go there, but this, the CIA airline. But this uh, was a small chartered aircraft airline that was used frequently by the US government in Vietnam, and the owner felt that he had a responsibility. So you will see on that video clip, the CBS News crew filmed it all. As the plane landed on the tarmac, uh, it is swarms of people come out towards it. It never got off the tarmac. It didn't go anywhere near the terminal. And eventually, or very quickly, the pilot decided that he dare not stop at all. He just continued slowly along the runway as people swarmed into the plane, most of them South Vietnamese soldiers, not the women and children he had come to evacuate. As the plane is speeding up, soldiers, South Vietnamese soldiers, start shooting at it and throwing grenades at it. It's damaged. There are people in the wheel wells. There are people who had opened the cargo uh, doors in every cargo container, every cargo hatch. The, that aircraft had, was one of those that had a rear stairwell going straight back under the tail. You can see the president of the airline standing there with a pistol in his hand trying to force people off the, off the ladder as they take, uh, build up speed because they already had too many people on board. And by a miracle, that plane took off, uh, vastly overloaded, leaking fuel, damaged from the gunfire and the, and the grenades. So that's what happens when you go to an unsecured airport, which is what we were landing in in Saigon. We were not in the American defense attaches offices part of the, v, the airport, which was secured by American troops. We were there with the Royal Australian Air Force, got a plane there and civilian aircraft. So taking out the, the people who had been sponsored 
without regard to the Vietnamese exit permit rules was out of the question. Um, so eventually, I had been there five days, uh, during which in the first night, uh, I was sitting in a house with my friend from Singapore, John Baker up there, who, who was the other visa officer and the young political officer of the embassy. We'd just come back, nine o'clock at night. We were having a scotch, and the world seemed to come to an end. The sky lit up bright as day. The house seemed to rise up off the foundation, and we all knew, you know, this is it. <laughs> the game is over. Uh, what had happened is an ammunition dump at an air base 15 miles away had been blown up by the Viet Cong. Uh, that was the last hope of any sleep I got for the next five nights. On top of that, you had to listen to your radio because the signal from the American embassy to go and gather at your evacuation point was Bing Crosby singing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. <laughs> so that had to be listened for as well. So the evacuation of the embassy took place uh, six days after I left. I returned to Hong Kong on the 18th of April on the 24th. A Canadian Armed Forces C-130 went from Hong Kong uh, back to Saigon to evacuate the embassy, and I took with it. I went with it, taking the last of the, I'm not sure how many, promise of visa letters that, uh, that we eventually issued. When we found we could not help people in Vietnam, we were wasting our time in the embassy just telling people that we sent letters to everyone who had been sponsored. Uh, to say that if they could get an exit permit and if they could get out of Vietnam and present this letter at any other Canadian mission, they would be accepted to go to Canada. That was the, the idea to make sure that everyone who had been sponsored knew that we knew about them. Um, I took the last of those on the April 24th flight and I handed them over to an international organization called International Social Service along with a few hundred dollars for them to mail them. And amazingly, those letters went through the Vietnamese postal system and 14 years later, uh, one of my friends then in Bangkok had one presented to him in Ho Chi Minh City by someone applying under the orderly departure program. I was truly amazed that as the city is falling, even for a few days afterwards, its postal system worked. Uh, the embassy evacuation, of course, was controversial highly criticized at the time. Um, whether or not it uh, was done properly, it was done. Um, the fact is that on the day of evacuation, I flew with that flight into Saigon. The air terminal, the civilian air terminal, was completely empty. No Vietnamese soldiers, no Vietnamese customs, no Vietnamese immigration officers, no Vietnamese police. Completely deserted. So we had the opportunity, we had a C-130 sitting there, we had the opportunity to take some people out. The locally engaged staff of the embassy had been canvassed, uh, and they and all the dependents they wanted to take amounted to about 90 people. Now a C-130 will take 92 fully equipped paratroopers, so it'll certainly take 90 people without any trouble. We had three embassy cars, and we had three embassy drivers, and we had three embassy officials, all of whom were familiar with Saigon. We could have gone and looked for the locally engaged employees to put them on the plane, but the chargé d'affaires, Ernest Hébert, was, I, I say, obsessed, it's my opinion, with the idea that we mustn't break the law of Vietnam. And somehow he seemed to think that even if the city fell, uh, and he went back, it would be good for him to be able to say to the conquerors that we did not break the laws of the conquered regime. Um, so nobody was taken, no effort was made to fill that plane on that day, even though it could have been, uh, without generating a stampede, if we'd been careful in searching through Saigon for the embassy staff and their, their dependents, we could have done it, but we did not. Uh, the fact that everybody, every Canadian on the tarmac, from the Air Force to the priests to the journalists to, to go other government employees disagreed with the stand that Ernest Hébert took, everyone disagreed with it, had cut no ice. So 
That's why nobody was taken out of Saigon, and I don't think this has ever been said publicly before. Now, when I returned to Hong Kong with that flight, we were all pretty depressed uh, on that flight, and I tried to remember what was the last time this had happened, and I was guessing it was probably Nanjing in 1951, although they didn't have a C-130. Uh, when I got back to Hong Kong, uh, we all sort of breathed a sigh of relief, you know, this is over for us. Uh, we had also been an evacuation center for Canadians being evacuated from Vietnam but on those Canadian Armed Forces flights. We ran a, we had a floor of a hotel where we sort of ran a reception center and a place for Canadians to stay bef so before they could get their flights to move out of Hong Kong. This is also where we kept the babies of the baby lift another big controversial matter from that time. And then a few days later, we received over 3,000 Vietnamese refugees on one ship, the Clara Maersk, container ship of the Maersk Line, which had picked them up from a sinking small Vietnamese freighter um, in the South China Sea after a number of US Navy ships came up to the sinking freighter and then sped away when they saw what was there. The Hong Kong government readily agreed to allow them to land and allowed us into the refugee camp uh, to examine them, as Joyce described that earlier. Uh, I remember taking the first group to the airport to put them on the CPR flight to Canada, and Hong Kong journalists had saying to me that we had managed to get some to Canada before the Hong Kong government had even allowed out of the camp those with the right to live in Hong Kong, and there were such people there. Uh, so that, that was a good start, but again, I thought that this is the end. Uh, you know, my involvement and Canada's involvement with Vietnamese refugees is over. Of course, I was not to know what was to come. But uh, I've mentioned a number of things in there. General Kwong is another thing that happened during that time. I was involved in the beginning of the chain of events that led to General Kwong arriving in Canada. You see, I haven't been imprisoned or shot for it, but th th that's another story. There's a, there were very good reasons for that. <laughs> Don, we're... we're uh, I know. Your turn. <clears throat> so I, I think you've heard a little bit of uh, an era that predates um, uh, or predates the sort of in, the intense period that are started in 1978. Um, so maybe we now will turn to two people who were very involved. And before we do so, I want to uh, call out Al Luki, who's with us today. Al was uh, based in Bangkok and was, uh, was a key member of the... Singapore. Singapore, Singapore. sorry. Yes, you were in Bangkok. Um, was a key member of the team. Um, there was a camaraderie amongst the group that was involved in this, uh, in this project, certainly in, in, in the late 70s, early 80s. So um, Maybe we'll start now with, um, with Dave Ritchie, who was um, based in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. I was going to say I'm going to uh, inflict a short PowerPoint on you. Gee, I didn't even get to 1979-81 in most <laughs> Singapore and Malaysia. In 1979, I was 29. I uh, kept some personal journals, and I looked back over the two years I was there, 79 to 81, and I ran across a few words. Um, I had words like exhaustion, exhilaration, this is me writing to myself at the time, pride, and deep feeling. So I, I just, looking back on these years in preparation for the conference, I just want to say that I think everyone in their work life, no matter what it is, should have that kind of job satisfaction. And uh, for me, I, I kept this personal in, uh, let's see if I can get this thing to go. There I am, 29, and that's Pulau Badang off the coast of Malaysia. Probably the most famous camp in our region, it visited by many Canadian media. I personally escorted the W5 team, uh, Montreal Star and Vancouver Sun reporters there. Uh, I don't know whether you can make out writing on the, on the back, on the side of the lane there above the kids, but it, it says, uh, welcome to Pulau Badong. I left 
Holland to go to uh, Singapore. I was supposed to have another two years in Holland, but like the pawn on a chessboard, I was quickly moved. I was cheap and easy to move around the world, and I found myself in Singapore. And one of the jokes in the Foreign Service is that there's always an operational exigency. <laughs> and uh, this was indeed an operational exigency. Uh, something is exigent, which means it cannot be ignored. It's too important to ignore. And that's what this situation was. I got there and I was the first of the incremental resources. The old and exhausted team, Ian Hamilton and Dick Martin, had, they deserved hero status. Um, they were the gentlemen who processed the Hai Hong refugees. And I was the first of the newcomers, which a few months down the road may be one of the old timers. But um, Ian and Dick had neglected the regular immigration program for a little bit, and here I was with four years immigration experience under my belt, and they said, okay, you're in charge of the normal immigration program. You have to fly off to Jakarta, fly off to KL, do some normal, some normal things. But before that happened, Ian Hamilton took me on an introductory tour of the, uh, the main part of the action at that point, which was Peninsular Malaysia. And I know you have a map in your kit of handouts there, but basically, uh, I want to explain what the reality was that the map doesn't show. Our, we, the refugee camps were all along that coastline on the right-hand side of the peninsular Malaysia, which was the backward side of Malaysia. It was a two-lane highway, which went from Kota Baru at the Thai border all the way down to Singapore. That's only 350 miles. But the reality was that in the very best conditions, it took 12 hours to drive 350 miles. Mm -hmm. And there, at that point, in early 79, camps were almost encampments. I actually saw boats pulled up on the beach with concertina wire around the boat. And that was, that, that was a camp with no name. And the refugees might stay there for days or weeks until they were moved to a slightly larger camp. At that particular point in my first week's trip, uh, Ian took me to six camps, and I won't bother naming them all, but they were, there were two near the beach at Kota Baru, starting at the north. Then we went down to Kuala Terengganu, and Kuala Terengganu is frequently mentioned because it was the fishing port from which you went out by boat, two and a half hours in leased fishing boat, to the island of Badong. Badong, in actual nautical miles, was about 19 miles offshore. It was slightly north of Kuala Terengganu, out in the ocean. So it was a long journey, which made a short interviewing day. If, if no matter what time you started, you could be on the dock at 7 o'clock, you still got there late morning, and you had a four or five hours of intensive interviewing, starting with putting that red flag down there on the table, to, if for nothing else, to claim your spot so the Aussies didn't get it. <laughs> and on three occasions, I slept in the camp, rather than take the two and a half hour journey back and then have to repeat it again the next day. It was e we could get more work in by staying in the camp. So twice, that red flag down there claimed the spot where I slept, because I, I slept on the work table where I had interviewed all day, which was a totally non-private area. It was in the middle of a large enclosure during the daytime, surrounded by hundreds of onlookers. And the third time I lucked out, I slept in the newly built two-story wooden hospital on the beach in Badong, and I got the upper bunk so that the rats wouldn't chew at anything. Mm -hmm. In early 79, I want to emphasize that through 79 and 80, 80 and 81, conditions constantly improved. So from month to month, from visit to visit, we could see improvements in the conditions. But in the first three months, April, May, June, 79, Badong was a terrible place. Uh, in Vietnamese, the, the, the people on the island had a play on words. They called it bidat, because people would say, well, what was it like to arrive here? And they'd, bidat means it was miserable. <laughs> it wasn't you know, a glorious welcome to freedom. It was a miserable place. The beach was covered in garbage and human waste. There, were no, there was no proper sanitation facilities. People had insufficient building materials. They chopped down virtually every tree on the, on the island. It looked like a bald man's head when you came in from the ocean with just a few little palm trees up top, like the last hairs. <laughs> there, terrible food. The Malaysian Red Crescent Society had not got organized enough to provide good food. People were living on canned sardines, which apparently everyone hated. And they weren't even getting rice at that point. All of that improved. There was very little potable water. People tried to dig wells all over the island, but unless you were 
very up high on the, on the, on the mountainside. Um, the water was not potable. It was contaminated by the ocean water. It was a pretty awful place. And it, I was amazed in researching for this conference. I went on to a website called Urban Dictionary. I don't know how reliable it is. But the, the, the story of Badong seems to have been passed down through the generations now. Because apparently in Amer American street lingo, lingo, which is what Urban Dictionary says it, uh, it defines, Badong is both a noun and a verb. Okay, So as a noun, let me just check my notes here. It's a very bad wrong, right? So that was a real bedong. It was a bad wrong. And I'm going to bedong you. You might guess what that means. It means I'm going to F you up. <laughs> so it's not very polite. And that's the memory of bedong for a lot of people. So three moving on. Three-minute warning. Three-minute warning? OK. Moving south, there's a city called Kwantan. There were beach encampments there. And I, I don't have photos to show you, but I do have some statistics. I, I kept a, a refugee list compiled by refugees, of, and it was compiled chronologically by boat arrival, which is the way all the camp lists were done, by chronological date of the boat's arrival. And people continue to identify by their boat numbers for years afterwards. And at that point in 1979, the beachside camp outside of Kwantung, which was called Cheriting, truly miserable place because it had no shade and no potable water, sand fleas and, and, and uh, scabies. Had 7,500 people. There were 483 boats had already arrived. This was 1979. Five of them had arrived in the last week, and one boat arrived the day we were interviewing with 79 people on board. So I have to forgive all the authorities all the way back to Ottawa that nobody was keeping up with the numbers. The numbers were constantly changing. So moving on down the coast, you go to another sleepy fishing village called Mersing. From there, you went out to a, a, a little mini bedong, an island called Tenga. And Tenga, at first glance, was more idyllic. And I'll, I'll come to some other pictures. There's the two-lane highway that we took. We often got stuck behind logging trucks. It was, remember, this was the first asylum country. This was a backward economically deprived part of Malaysia. Everyone was Muslim. The local governments were sultanates. It wasn't the most welcoming place for ethnic Vietnamese. Once the Chinese expulsion started, it became less welcoming, as, as suddenly most of the boat people were turning Chinese. That's the, the countryside we were in. The fact that Ottawa was woefully behind on the numbers, there were probably 10,000 people alone still on the beaches. The trip out to Bedong, for two months of the year, you face seas like that during a monsoon season. That's the beach in Bedong. Wrecked ships. That's the island, a hospital, the two-story wooden building I was talking about. My mention of Cheriting. Tenga, scavenged. It had been all palm trees, all of them chopped down. Very much like a mini Bedong. You've probably seen pictures of Bedong because it was the most photographed. And at first, you might think Tenga was quite an exotic, lovely place. And it really became one of my favorite camps. It had a lovely white sand beach. And it is now, in modern Malaysia, a return to being a resort. But you had to remember that there was no leaving the place. And you notice the shoot on sight sign. So on that very first trip, Ian and I took 600 refugees. Those are the facts of the, uh, of the journey. And I, the, the irony to me was that that 600 refugees was 50% larger than the entire immigrant visa issuance that I'd been doing back in The Hague. <laughs> so I know Scott wants me to wrap up. I, I just want to pick up on one last point before I, I leave this. Um, we talked about the value of the designated class earlier. Um, I turned to Ian and I said, how do you do this? How do we do this? Here you are in equatorial jungle, and you're surrounded by thousands of people. At this point, we did not have sponsorships to lead us to priority cases. We had just a mass of people. And I said, how do you choose these people? Well, of course, there's common sense things. Do they speak English? Do they speak French? Do they have some, some skill that might be useful in Canada? Do they have family connections in Canada? All of those things come to a visa officer's mind.
But Ian's answer to me was, choose them by the sparkle in their eyes. Right? Some of our first panelists this morning, refugees themselves, I saw that sparkle in their eyes. And that, that is what led to their success in Canada. I'll leave Thank it you. there. Thanks very much. So Murray, you don't have PowerPoint, but you have lots of stories and memories to share, so please. I was born long before PowerPoint. Can everyone hear me? Uh, briefly, through the first part of my adventures in this, and then I'll talk a little bit about the selection criteria and the camps. I was in Thailand, but in 1975, when the movement started, the evacuation of Saigon, I was working the east coast of the United States. So I went to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida twice, to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas twice, and opened a processing facility in Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And if you can find that on a map, you're doing very well. An old uh, military base that had been used to demob the US Army as the Army in 1945 and 46. And we selected about five or 600 people out of those folks who were in the US. They were already in the US. Their situation wasn't that critical. In, on November 11th of 1978, myself and one other officer arrived in <clears throat> Bangkok to open the processing there. At that point, we were supposed to process about six boat families a month and 20 overland refugee families a month. This was pretty doable and didn't seem too difficult. But of course, we were overtaken by the events. And I will go through the numbers of boat arrivals. And remember, Thailand was not major boat arrival, but it gives you some idea of the numbers. 75, 377, 76, 5,617, 77, 21,270, 78, 106,489, 79, 292,305 boat arrivals. Most of the people who came to Thailand came overland, as we had a speaker this morning who came from Laos. There were probably 200,000 refugees in Thailand by the time we set up our operations. Some camps, 40 to 50,000 people in them. And we experienced mission creep as they kept giving us new quotas and the way they would tell you about a new quota was they would say, you've got a new quota, and by the way, there will be this schedule of charters coming down. You are to fill them and get them out of there. Again, you did it at night because uh, the airlines told us if they took off after 4 o'clock in the morning, the government of Canada got charged another $150,000 because the airplane had to land somewhere to refuel. If they got out before then, they could make it all the way to Canada, and it wouldn't cost us so much. The, to set up our operation, we had to deal with the UNHCR, with IOM, and the host government. And remember that all of these host governments, including the Thai government, did not want these people in their country. And they kept saying, if you don't arrange to get them out of here, we will push them back. And that certainly happened in Thailand especially with the Cambodians. As the program grew and grew, the target got bigger. <clears throat> Working in the camps, and I was asked by uh, the Laotian family, who obviously I was involved in processing, what did you do and how did you do it? There was no UN registration. UNHCR did not have a register of the people in the camps except for the Vietnamese boat camps and there were only about four or five thousand of those. So when you went into the camp, you had no idea who you were dealing with, whether they had been processed by anybody else, <coughs> whether in fact they were supposed to be in the camp at all. So there was mention made of the Canadian officers showing up with a list from the UN we never had a list from the UN. We did have lists of people who were sponsored from Canada, and we would go and look for them. After that, it was 
persons with sponsors in Canada, excuse me. <coughs> persons identified by group sponsors in Canada, people who claim families in Canada, <coughs> and will these people resettle successfully <coughs> with the assistance available to them? Now the question was asked to me, why were we sent to Montreal? This is the Laotian family. We didn't send anybody anywhere. We put them on an airplane. <laughs> Whether it was going to Edmonton or to Montreal was not a concern of ours. It had to be full. <coughs> and that was it. We started with two Canadian officers. We ended up with probably 15 working at some times. We were always short-staffed. We always were extremely busy. The demand was there. The first officer who came in with me was a gentleman named Bob Shelka. We got there in November. He came to me in July and said, I haven't had a day off. I said, Bob, take a Sunday in August. <laughs> <coughs> came to me in September and he said, I still haven't had a day off. And I said, Bob, it's not August. <laughs> and that was it. IOM was of a great deal of assistance to us. And of the sponsoring groups, I have to single out the Mennonite Central Committee. They were fantastic. A couple of other little things that came along in the process. Unaccompanied minors. It was always thought that an unaccompanied minor was a nice little person. The unaccompanied minors we had were between 16 and 25. <coughs> depending on whether they lied their age or not. Uh, then there was a big push by the Quebec government for Cambodians. This was before the time of Pol Pot. There weren't any Cambodians, or very few Cambodians, so we had a lot of trouble selecting them and getting them there. Once the sponsorship system got going, and fortunately Michael talked about the matching taking place after, we got the shopping for refugees. We would like a refugee family that speaks English or French, and he should have the mechanical skills, or she should be able to, excuse me, we didn't have time for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so we just let, fortunately, the matching then was uh, sent back to Ottawa, and <coughs> that worked much better. A Couple of other problems we had. One of them, and Michael referred to it, was the medical holds. Because we, if you look at the map of where the camps are in Thailand, they're all on the border. Once the people were selected, they were brought to Bangkok where they were medically examined. If there was a suspected TB case in the family, then they were held in the transit center. We had families there for six to 10 months while we were working through the TB hold problem. About every second month, the UNHCR would assure us that they would have x-ray machines in the camps in the next month to deal with it. We never had them there. So that finally, we had to ask the Thai government to open a special uh, transit center in Bangkok to deal with these people who were there long term. It's got to be miserable to sit in a transit center for six or eight months when you feel fine but you have to have another sputum culture to determine whether or not you really don't have TB. Australians had another approach which was rendered the uh, tuberculosis incommunicable. Uh, we couldn't persuade our authorities to do that, so we had some families stuck in Bangkok for a very long time. Now, I'm prepared to answer any questions, but I think that's it. Am I on my yes, time? Yes, you are, in fact, right on your time. It's <coughs> eight minutes. Thank you. So I think you've heard some uh, some stories and some vignettes from the, sorry, from the, that's where I was going. Thank you. <laughs> from the, some of the Canadian immigration officers who were involved. Now perhaps a perspective from, from the days of what was ISIM, but is now right. IOM. And Dick, do you want to share some thoughts? Yes, and I have a visual aid. Oh, good. It's actually <laughs> an, old an old shirt from 1979 to remind me of the days when it was, in fact, the Intergovernmental Committee for European Migration. And if you don't think that didn't cause some confusion in Southeast Asia, <laughs> think again. <laughs>
<laughs> it was the first, first time I ever presented a card or talked to somebody. They said, what? What are you doing out here? So we, we, we got into that, but uh, it, was, um, it was a question. And in fact, at that time, ICEM was, was very European. We had, I think, 33 members. They were almost exclusively from uh, Europe or Latin America or the Western Hemisphere. And um, I think 10 observers, of which there was one from Thailand. In, it, Thailand was an observer in 75, and I'm sure that's when they became an observer, because we opened our office in, um, in Thailand in 1975 in response to the, the, the Indo-Chinese program. We'd only had one office in uh, Asia up until that point, which was in Hong Kong, to deal with. So, and that had been there since 1952 to deal with a whole other set of refugees uh, coming out of China. So up until that, uh, at that point, we had, I think that year, IOM moved um, 61,000 people globally, of which 20,000 of them were from, Indo were, were from Asia, were Indo-Chinese. So even in the first year, uh, the Indo-Chinese program was a pretty substantial portion of, of what IOM was doing. Um, and even though, you know, we were, we were ICEM throughout this entire uh, period from 75 to 80, I'm going to use IOM because I'm more used to it, it's quicker, that sort of thing. So just the, the IOM name change didn't come until later. So in, at that point, you know, IOM was relatively small. I think we can safely say that we were a shrinking organization. Um, we had very little experience in Asia, except for that one office. But on the other hand, we were <laughs> at that time and, and continue to be a pretty operational organization. We'd had experience in large movements, um, including in emergencies like the, the movement um, after the in Czechoslovakia in 68, Ugandans in the early 70s, etc. So by virtue of that, we had a, a fairly large number of experienced staff which we could call in to, to respond to emergencies globally. I must say that when I joined IOM, I think I was 26 at the time, I very quickly noted that there was this huge gap in the staff. We had the experienced staff from headquarters and other long-term offices that were almost invariably over 50. And then we had all sorts of new staff who were almost invariably under 30. There was this, this gap between 30 and 50 where IOM, since it had been shrinking for so long, we really had nobody. It was, it was quite noticeable. Um, you know, when, when governments, when, when situations occur that governments ask IOM, IOM's help, um, we do what we typically do and what we did in Indochina is just figure out what it is that is required to get people from where they are um, to where they need to go. Uh, as I said, we brought in staff from all over the place. Um, 1975, our major focus was in Guam. Uh, but we had also opened a Bangkok office, uh, and our Hong Kong office was dealing with, um, you know, the scattered groups that were other, other places in, in Asia. Um, sort of as a, Guam as an example, because it was kind of interesting. Um, most of the people there went, uh, from there went to the U.S., but there were those who wanted to go to other countries because they had family ties or whatever. Uh, and while Canada <coughs> and Australia sent visa officers to Guam to deal with cases that needed to be resettled in, in those two countries, uh, really other countries did not. So IOM, uh, handled a, a fairly long, uh, a complex process. I thought it was complex when I read about it. Um, we had to, we compiled the case histories for cases that wanted to go somewhere else. We, including details about potential sponsors in, in countries. Um, one thing that leaped out at me, and I think Mike mentioned earlier, we telexed. Now, it, it, sitting in a, in, a, in a room where everybody has cell phones and iPads and email and this, that, and the other thing, um, the fastest way of communicating um, movements was by telex. Uh, you sat down and you typed into a machine which looked like a little typewriter with a tape coming out of it. It just was a very, very different, um, different age, particularly for, for, um, for communications. So we would, the IOM officers there would telex the data on cases to IOM headquarters. IOM headquarters would take it over to the, 
the, the missions in Geneva or, or wherever was necessary, those uh, countries would either accept the cases or not. They would send the visa authorizations to uh, the consulates in Hong Kong because IOM had an arrangement with the Hong Kong authorities that if we brought somebody from Guam in the morning, took them over to the consulate to get their visas, and put them on an airplane for their final destination that same night, that they would, al they would allow that to be done. Um, as obviously a number of people have mentioned, um, countries were pretty sensitive about getting stuck with more uh, refugees. So it was complicated as well by families getting split up during um, the departure from uh, that confused time of departing from, from Vietnam. So we had to see where families were, try and reunite them, sometimes bring them together sort of on different flights, meet them up somewhere so they could arrive in the, in the country uh, um, together. You're a three-minute warning. Three-minute warning. Okay. I'm, I don't talk as fast as I thought I did. Um, so um, in general, what IOM did was transportation, the obvious one, uh, about half a million people during that five-year period, including um, 48,000 or so to Canada. Um, the movements to Canada were from 16 different countries. <coughs> Medical services, including um, examination for uh, whatever was required by the country for, for entry, and also uh, sort of pre-departure checks to make sure that they were okay to travel, um, putting files together for documentation so that uh, countries could make a determination um, on admission, uh, eventually putting together all the paperwork for travel. And we, because programs were so large, we would have staff that would specialize in, in different countries because different countries had different requirements. Although these were all um, general, uh, what we did, different countries wanted a different, different menu, different services. Um, let me talk a little bit about Hong Kong, which is where I um, worked most closely with the, the Canadian program. We would get the list of accepted cases from the Canadian consulate arrange medical screenings, um, send the results back to the consulate. When the people were cleared for departure, we would get all the documentation, including the, the entry visa, the warrant, et cetera, uh, for travel arrangements. We would coordinate with the consulate on the travel dates, and the consulate would, would provide the information, the necessary information on arrival to all of the required parties in Canada. Um, there was also, at some points in time, a, a pre-departure cultural orientation course which uh, refugees went through. And then when departing, um, we, had to, we had to communicate carefully with the immigration department, because Hong Kong immigration, when they admitted somebody, they gave them a piece of paper that said they were there legally. When they departed, they wanted to see the same piece of paper saying that they were leaving, because, boy, they wanted to keep track of who was there and who wasn't. So that, when you, when you had a kind of gap of months and years between arrival and departure, that could get a little sticky, because it sure wasn't computerized. Um, and then well, one somewhat unique problem to Hong Kong was the amount of, of baggage that refugees could accumulate and have. Uh, they were, I mean, it was a good thing because refugees were permitted to work in Hong Kong and they could earn money and they, they could save money and they could naturally want to be prepared for when they went to, to their resettlement country, but it did create problems for airline departures because they would arrive at the airport in spite of all the counseling that we could give with um, huge amounts of baggage. So it was, um, the Indo-Chinese program was certainly a, a major chain, game changer for IOM because I think it started the process of a return from a somewhat long and slow decline over the previous years. And I think there was also a fairly pr direct link between the return of certain countries like Australia, Canada, to, the or to membership in the organization because of the work that we, we were able to do together on the program. So I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, everyone. I just thought I'd say um, I arrived in Hong Kong in 1978 on my first posting, and I was 21. And I went to Singapore. I was no, I'd barely gotten into my apartment, or SQ, as it's referred to in those days. Um, and got sent to Singapore uh, to help out on the Hai Hong, which had arrived. And so with Dick and, uh, <coughs> and Ian uh, spent some time. And I also did the same trip that uh, David referred to down the coast of Malaysia on one trip. We had a quota uh, that was in, that would have been in December 1978. We were allowed to take 50 people. Um, we did all of the same camps that, uh, that you alluded to on that trip. 
And then I returned to Hong Kong and spent uh, the uh, remainder of my posting essentially in the, uh, in the camps in Hong Kong, which were quite different and very, very much more organized than my colleagues who were sitting in places like Bangkok and, uh, and Singapore uh, and even in, in the Philippines and elsewhere we're, we're dealing with. So we were, we were kind of the, we drove to the camps and we came on home for, you know, normal lives and we had days off, uh, although we worked long hours, <coughs> but we were living in a much more normal uh, location which also meant that every once in a while a plane would be redirected because there'd be some challenge with filling it somewhere else. And so we would be told that uh, the 747 that was supposed to go to you know, Singapore was in fact going now going to go to Hong Kong because we had a um, much easier time in dealing with the logistics than our colleagues did in, in other places. Um, <clears throat> so I think you've gotten a little bit of a feel for uh, what life was like in those uh, environments. I think one of the themes I want to pick up, which was an earlier comment, which was the sort of discretion uh, aspect of the role, um, because I think uh, certainly looking back on, on my own experience, and I'd be interested in others' uh, thoughts on the same, was that, we, that the flexibility and the discretion that we had in the ability, for example, for organizations like the UN to call us when they had problems um, meant that we could solve problems without the constraints of many of our uh, colleagues from other countries. I spent a fair bit of time in Macau. Uh, I can remember one particular case where uh, I was presented with um, a, an elderly man in his mid-70s who had married and two perfectly identical twin um, sisters were <coughs> came up with him. Um, and he had married both of them. Um, after I got over sort of the fantasy of this notion of what this must have been like at some point in time, um, they were also in their 70s, and he had, even though he had children from the first wife in the U.S., the Americans were doing a very sort of classic American checking, checking the box, being very technical and saying he was a bigamist and therefore was not allowed in. And so we, you know, could we solve the problem? Well, the problem was easily solved by me deciding that, in fact, they were, one was a maiden aunt and, you know, they were clearly sisters. and. The first one was uh, identified as the oldest, and she was the mother of all the children, and uh, life marched on, and off they went to Canada. Because we didn't, you know, we weren't uh, operating, we, were, we had been given the mandate as Minister, former Minister Aki said, to get on with this. Would you agree, others at the table with that, Murray? Yeah. Uh, Michael referred to the Mong family, where he came in and presented his two wives, and I said, why don't you go out and figure out which one is your dead brother's widow and which one is your wife, and come back. <laughs> <laughs> he figured it out, and we moved him. <laughs> Murray was known for his sensitivity at all the times. <laughs> But I think that problem solving, I, I think everyone would agree, was really one of the things that did differentiate us. Even our Australian colleagues were not operating under the same flexibility that, that we had. So quite often we were presented with, um, with problem cases or challenging cases. Let's talk a little bit about unaccompanied minors because um, as you, you indicated, most of them were not, um, not six years old coming off of boats. And in fact, in my experience, most of them were rarely unaccompanied. Um, but perhaps, David, do you want to talk about that? Yes. Um, uh, when I look at the his historical data, I see that uh, Canada accepted 388 unaccompanied minors. And my recollection is that our office in Singapore was tasked with finding 150. I think we far exceeded that target because Quebec immigration worked independently on the project. And again, if you look at those statistics, most of them, the majority of unaccompanied minors did go to the province of Quebec. So, however, I may be responsible for the bulk of them that ended up in English Canada. I went to Bidong in, uh, uh, under that instruction to find 150. And what I discovered was, as was mentioned, that there was mostly teenage boys, and it was mostly teenage boys because they were draft dodgers. And they had been practicing um, falsehood and playing with their a ages their birth dates for years, and it was hard to get them to come clean now and s tell us the actual truth. Um, some of them carried false documentation about their birth dates, but the whole point had been to back up their birth date to avoid national conscription into the communist army. And when eventually the, even the falsified birth date came up and their name appeared on the list um, again, even though they may have borrowed their cousin's identity or their younger brother's identity, um, the family, often poor, 
could only scrape together enough money to get rid of the one boy who was the, the crux of the problem. And so sometimes these young lads left together. Um, I would say I was given a list at Pulau Badong, and they called them families. There was actually 73 families of unaccompanied minors and 93 individuals. So they were about 80% male, 20% female. And uh, the reason that there were families was that sometimes siblings traveled together, so that was a family. Sometimes there was just a group of boys who left together, and they counted them as a family because there was no other relatives. And the more I explored these cases, though, they, they turned out to be quite lengthy interviews um, because of the reluctance of these kids sometimes to tell the truth and the lack of any documentation that could be relied on. Um, the, the more I explored it, the, the more I decided I, I couldn't tell the difference either between a, a Vietnamese boy who was 16 and, and one who was 19. And I, I knew from expectations, from what little trickle back I was getting from Canada, that from the Canadian media, that there were a lot of uh, foster families in Canada that were expecting darling children. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to disabuse that notion. So this one and only time I, I asked explicitly for uh, Vietnamese assistance at Pulau Badong, and I asked the, the Vietnamese organizing committee to provide me with a secretary and interpreter who were both female and both attractive. And that proved to be the key to sorting out the ages of these young men. <laughs> it turned out that these particular women spoke GI English rather than school English. And the reason was that they had both been Saigon bar girls. So they weren't the normal kind of help I had. They were extremely pleasant to work with. But their whole livelihood and intuition was invaluable in, in sorting out not only the physiology of these young men, actually how old they were, but their psychological state. I mean, Vietnam was a war-torn country. Many of these boys were from the wrong side of the tracks within Vietnam. Many of them were traumatized individuals, and they weren't what a, a Canadian foster family was expecting or, or a Canadian church group sponsoring them was expecting. So out of that 93 that I started with in Badong, and these were all of the potentials, I accepted 53 one day. <coughs> so anyone who was on the other end, the receiving end, I hope you were satisfied with what I, what I managed to find. I think that raises the question of expectations, the Canadian expectations versus the realities on the ground. There was this perception in Canada that the camps were full of unaccompanied minors. Um, and I mean, in those sorts of, that story I think tells a, a, a great one. Often, I think what we found too was that, of course, there may have been a cousin, but as far as the cousin was along for the ride, and so that if you pulled the string, you had, in fact, a, a family. Um, this was not sort of some kid who, you know, at 70 years old or at 17 years old, who was literally alone. But expectations you referenced, um, the, the challenge of the what we called in Hong Kong the Sears catalog approach to sponsorship, which was mom, dad, two kids, dad had to be a mechanic, mom had to be a seamstress. Um, some English children should be between 8 and 12, preferably one boy and one girl. <laughs> we literally got those kinds of requests from, from sponsors. Um, other expectations that we found challenging, Don, or, you know, in terms of what you saw, in terms of what people's impressions were, what was the, and what the reality was on the ground? Well, I think uh, this issue has been raised that, that caused us so much trouble, tuberculosis. This was some, uh, an issue that we never could get understanding of, I think, in Canada, because, of course, there were among the naysayers those, you know, these people will bring diseases to Canada. Um, the, the problem that we, we had with managing this was, wait for it, this is a matter of provincial jurisdiction. <laughs> the Federal Health Authority ends at the port of entry with the Quarantine Act. That's the limit of federal authority. Once you're beyond that, it's provincial. Quarantine is provincial. So Mike Malloy had the unenviable task of the worst nightmare of a Canadian public official to get all 10 provinces to agree to something with the predictable result. Now, I, I hope Mike will tell the whole story at some point over the next few days because he, he is the one who did try to, to solve it. But the consequence, 
as Murray said, uh, at our end was transit camps that contained a higher and higher proportion of refugees who were there because they were being tested for tuberculosis. And the Canadian tuberculosis test, the one that all 10 provinces agree on, is that you must have two chest x-rays taken three months apart showing absolutely no change, not even an improvement in your, in your chest x-ray, and you must have positive sputum cultures. Sputum is cultured for six weeks, as I recall. So this, every time the poor refugee is told, no, you've, you've got to be tested again, that's a minimum three-month delay. And it was not uncommon for that to uh, happen multiple times. So we ended up in Kuala Lumpur, our transit camp, we, we had one of our own, uh, run by the Malaysian Red Crescent Society, but it happened to be on the football field of the convent of the Holy Infant Jesus which was very, very fortunate because although the convent had no official role in the running of the camp, uh, this, the superior, uh, Sister Monica, uh, went in there and made sure that the TB hold people got the best possible food, all the exercise that could be given. I mean, we had 18, we, we, feel, we felt the capacity of that football field was 1,800 people, but at times, because of the TB hold, we had 4,000. Now, if any of these people had really had TB, active tuberculosis, you can just imagine how stupid that was. But again, this is a federal provincial problem, and uh, I guess some of those provincial officials were afraid of the you know, these people are bringing diseases to Canada. One thing that the, these officers do learn about tuberculosis quite early in their careers is that it can be rendered non-infectious quite quickly. Several weeks of treatment will render an active case of tuberculosis non-infectious. Tuberculosis can never be cured. It can be made inactive, uh, but it can reactivate. So non-infectious is what you want. That's what the Australians were doing, and I recently discovered, although I arrived in Singapore in, in August of 1979, that up until June 79, my predecessors had taken it upon themselves to follow the Australian pattern without any authority from immigration headquarters in Ottawa. They referred them to the tuberculosis hospital in Kuala Lumpur for treatment, uh, to render them non-infectious, and then they sent them to Canada. When somebody in Ottawa found out about that, that was the end of it. But th that's just another part of the discretion that, that visa officers tend to perhaps exercise beyond the limit, but it worked in that case. But this, I think, is a perception problem on the part of provincial health officials. They didn't want to take any risk whatsoever with someone who might have had tuberculosis, but it caused us immense problems. I think all of us at this table will remember the dreaded M4, which oh, yeah. the, the notion that someone did not pass the tuberculosis test. We had cases in Hong Kong. I used an interpreter for two and a half years, and he was a 24-year-old guy before he finally got on the plane, and he, no matter what, ha I don't, you know, don't know the medical reasons, but we could not get him to an inactive state. Um, we had at least one case of, of an elderly woman committing suicide um, because I think she had been there at that point about 18 months and we tended to keep the whole family uh, and for obvious reasons because quite often it was elderly people who did not uh, pass the, the, the tuberculosis test. So as Mike has alluded, I think that's if there is a, a dark spot on this movement, it is that file was incredibly frustrating for those of us in the field. I think now perhaps time for, uh, for questions uh, from the floor. I assume we are going to wrap up at 5. Um, so we have approximately half an hour, according to my watch. So I'm happy to take any questions directed generally or specifically to any of the panelists. Please. Um, hi, I'm Naomi Alboim. Um, actually, I want to add from um, each of the four areas that you talked about, the Hmong, the unaccompanied minors, Canadian expectations, and TB. Um, I think it might be interesting for folks, and maybe for you, from the Canadian side, how we had to deal with your decisions. So um, I, was, um, I was sort of Mike's equivalent for the Ontario region. 
of Canada Employment Immigration Commission. I was the um, Ontario Regional Coordinator for the Indo-Chinese Refugee Ta uh, Task Force at, at, um, at that time, uh, from 79 and uh, beyond. So, the Hmong. We weren't told that maiden aunt or sister-in-law or sister were really wives. And we got these telexes with long, long telexes with all um, the non-information that would have been helpful for us to know, particularly given that some of these polygamous families were going to Mennonite churches. And people in those churches were saying, oh, this is strange behavior. <laughs> this man seems to have a very close relationship with his sister-in-law. Um, and it did cause some, some difficulties on arrival. <coughs> Um, we also, uh, and we did have people like Hughley Montgomery who had to deal with these situations. He was one of the refugee liaison officer in the Kitchener-Waterloo area where a lot of the Mongs were initially um, settled. Um, I don't know, Mike, whether, whether I remember writing a note up to Mike saying um, these are some of the implications about the selection process, which, I mean, we were very happy to have people come. but. What is going to happen in terms of pensions, inheritance, um, entitlements as spouses? If they are not spouses, but they really are spouses, are we disentitling um, women from things that are, that are due them? I don't remember I ever getting a response from, from Mike Molloy about <laughs> what we might... A superb question, though. <laughs> so um, so there, there, there was that. I was also responsible for negotiating with the provincial government the unaccompanied minor program and putting into place uh, because the province is responsible for protection of, of young people and they were responsible for identifying the foster families that would be taking in these kids. Um, uh, it, was, it was an interesting an, a negotiation process. Some of the families that they recruited were looking for little boys and girls. Um, and when we went back to them and said, well, no, it's really going to be teenage boys and perhaps teenage boys that have lived in difficult circumstances and perhaps have had to do difficult things in order to survive, and you may want to prepare the families for these um, kinds of kids. None of the families backed out, and they all still wanted to proceed. First of all, I don't think they believed us because they, they still thought they were going to get a very cute little girl coming, coming to their house. Um, but also, I think that they actually were motivated to help and wanted to, to help in some way. Um, this is a program where there were some real success stories and there were some real problems um, and some recommendations for how we might want to proceed um, if we ever were to do this uh, again. Um, but I think the, um, and I, I mean, I won't, there is one wonderful, I mean, I went out to Griesbach to meet that first group of unaccompanied minors, and we had, the families had prepared these wonderful scrapbooks to introduce um, the unaccompanied minors to the families where they would be going, and they, they stayed in the staging areas longer than other refugees in order to go through some kind of orientation about what to expect. And I went through some of the scrapbooks um, with some of these kids. Um, and um, many, well, there, I think I told Howard the story. There was, um, uh, fast forward to 1998, and I was um, called down to, um, to um, go through the jury selection process. And I don't know if you know, in downtown Toronto, there's a huge sort of holding area. Everybody's sitting there, you go up and you're, interviewed or, you know, to determine whether you're capable of being a jury member or not. And while in this holding area, I heard the name that I knew was one of the unaccompanied minors, that because all these files that I, they become living people to you, uh, even though you haven't met them, but, but this one I actually did meet out in Griesbach. And I went up to her and I said, Are, were you, did you come here as an unaccompanied minor? Yes. Did you come with your little brother? Yes. Did you go live with Madame Dubé in Eastern Ontario? And she said, yes, how do you know about, about me? How do you know about all this stuff? And I said, well, um, I met you before. And she looked at me and looked at me and said, you were the one that went through the scrapbook with me. 
And I said, yes, that was the case. The bottom line was she was selected for jury duty. I was not. <laughs> <laughs> and your, your time for, for question has almost okay. come to an end. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, um, well, the Canadian expectations for sponsorship, we were doing the matching between the uh, NATS, the notification of rival telexes, and the destination matching request for the sponsored uh, refugees that you were selecting, and we had to match them up with uh, sponsorship applications. Michael had a computer, perhaps, in Ottawa. We did not in Ontario. We had index cards, mm -hmm. and we were matching index cards to these um, long, long telexes. But I remember women in my office calling up a sponsoring group. She knew nothing except it was on the telex, and she said, do I have the sweetest family for you? <laughs> <laughs> and we would actually have to sell these families to some of the sponsoring groups and tell them they weren't going to get the mother and father and two children, but, but someone else. Um, tuberculosis, last thing. Um, again, this was something that I was responsible for working with the pro provincial government on, and more importantly, with the um, local municipal level, because it was a local public health department who were responsible for medical surveillance after people arrived. The problem was we often didn't know where the refugees ended up after they left the reception area, particularly the government-assisted refugees. And it was very difficult for us to work with the local public health departments who, who were responsible for the surveillance to ensure that people were taking their medication or to be sure that they were becoming um, not contagious anymore um, when we didn't know where they had actually ended up. So just the other side of the coin. Other questions? Oh, sorry. We have, oh, some comments? Well, I would just like to talk about the TB part of it. The medical surveillance system has existed since time immemorial for people with uh, suspected tuberculosis, and it has not worked since time immemorial. It's not unique to this program. Um, and uh, we would all like a system that worked, but no one has come up with one yet. Back to your memo to Michael Malloy about what's going to happen as we divorced these families and somebody was going to be disentitled down the line. It had been a lot more disentitled if we'd have left them in the refugee camp. But the implications are nonetheless interesting. I, I, you know, I hadn't thought until you put it in that context. Unaccompanied minors, these were kids that were between the age of 14 and 25. Now, when do they get their old age pension in Canada? I have no idea because nobody knew how old they were. <laughs> Question. Well, it's just a, a follow up on the TB program. I worked for and with Naomi in Ontario. And I remember, I, I don't know the people, maybe they were rendered inactive and they came. And with the work with the province of Ontario, a number of refugees came and went to sanatoriums in Ontario. There was an underused sanatorium in Thunder Bay where a lot of uh, the refugees went. And um, unfortunately, the employment counselor in the local CEC that was working there uh, contacted TB. And I remember being sent to Thunder Bay one time to meet with the staff because it created a bit of an uh, employee relations problem. You know, I think uh, in, in talking about this after speaking with Howard the other day, I was thinking about the, the different tests you use in administrative tribunals and so on. Was there beyond a reasonable doubt that the woman got the TB from the refugees? I don't think so. Was it more plausible than not? Quite likely. But that's, that's just one example I thought I would mention. We were well aware of the issues that we were going on, that were going on with you guys, and we were doing what we could in Ontario to try to resolve it. And the other comment is that uh, we use the Eaton's catalog as an example. <laughs> <laughs> other questions or, or comments? Please. Sorry, sorry to see you with the light over there. Uh, my name's Claire Ewart Fisher, and I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And um, I have two questions, and they're embedded in my own personal story. Don Cameron, when were you in uh, Saigon in 1975? I was there from April the 14th to 18th, 
and back on the 24th, and my friend John Baker up there was there from April the 4th to the 16th. Who is your friend? I'd like to see his hand. Hi. I was in Saigon in, on April 4th, 1975, and I was there with my husband, Wally, and my infant child, Matt, who it was 13 months old, and he's Vietnamese. He did not have, uh, we, the, the adoption was not yet complete, and so we were there trying to get permission for um, dependents of Canadians to leave with us on, a, on an evacuation flight that was on its way to Hong Kong. It had just come in, the C-130 Herc had just come in from Trenton, Ontario, and it was on its way back to uh, Hong Kong. Uh, a sidebar on this is that earlier that week there were, uh, and I don't remember the, name, the kind of plane it was, but it was a large one that was contained, that contained uh, Cambodian infants, Cambodian children, unaccompanied um, infants uh, that was on its way to Canada. As it was taking off at the Townsend Yuk Airport, it crashed, and there were 63 orphans that were left. Um, my son did not get permission to leave as a dependent of a Canadian, but he got, uh, he was part of this group that was Cambodian refugees. Anyhow, I'm just wondering, whatever happened to them? Um, you're, I guess you're talking about what we call the baby lift. Um, this was the, 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 the flight from Vietnam, uh, from Saigon to Hong Kong, was organized really by the late Naomi Bronstein. Uh, and she had been scheduled to go on that American flight that crashed with uh, her group of, of babies. It, um, fortunately, she, uh, the flight was changed, the time was changed, and she wasn't notified, so she and her babies were not on the flight. Um, she, knowing there were Canadian C-130s in Saigon, she approached Ernest Hébert, the Chargé d'Affaires, about taking them to uh, Canada. We were not involved, John and I were not involved in it. This was Naomi dealing with the Chargé d'Affaires who had the authority to instruct the airlift commander to take the babies. Um, I was one of those that met that flight on arrival in Hong Kong, and I well remember the ramp on the C-130 being lowered and seeing the floor entirely covered with cardboard boxes strapped to the floor, and in each cardboard box was a baby. Um, those babies were, you know, totally undocumented. There were some documentations that Naomi had, but the documents didn't match all of the children. Uh, the, some of the children, I think, were replacements for those that died on the American crash. Um, so there we were, all these babies, uh, and what are we to do? The Hong Kong Immigration Department, as usual, proved to be extremely cooperative and allowed us to bring them into Hong Kong on our undertaking that we would take them out even though we didn't know if we could do that. Um, so we took them to a hotel in Hong Kong that we had a floor rented on uh, for the Canadians being evacuated from Vietnam. And we had taken all Canadian evacuees there first before they made their own arrangements to return to Canada. And we then sent out the word for every Canadian employee of the commission to come to this hotel to start looking after babies. Um, there weren't enough of us, so uh, Staff Sergeant Art Missler, one of our RCMP officers, was the president of the Canadian Club of Hong Kong at that time, and he phoned them and they came in too. So, uh, you know, we, we had all of these undocumented babies, some of whom were not properly identified, some of whom had clearly been in the CFA crash. I remember one who just lay there flashing his head back and forth, back and forth. Um, so what, what happened uh, next was we realized we had to move them on to Canada as quickly as possible. We certainly didn't have the capability to care for them for very long, and we didn't want to ask any the Hong Kong government to do it. Uh, so we looked for volunteers uh, to accompany them to Canada. Uh, my wife was one of the volunteers. Uh, most of the accompanying people who were not 
with Naomi Bronstein, because she, she was on the flight to the Canadian Air Force flight uh, to Hong Kong, and with some of her volunteer escorts. So almost all of the Canadian uh, spouses who volunteered were the wives of visa officers. Uh, curiously, none of them had at that point children or they might not have volunteered. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife has only vague recollections of the CPR flight from uh, Hong Kong to Vancouver and then she went on to Toronto uh, with some of her, her children that she was looking after. She doesn't even remember how many. Uh, but uh, this was, um, it was a very touchy issue for us in Hong Kong, both with the Hong Kong government and provincial legal authorities, you know, provincial child welfare authorities have authority in cases like this, not the federal government. Again, I'm talking about federal and provincial jurisdiction, but it's a very, very real issue. Um, we didn't really know who these children were. We, know, we knew who Naomi said they were. Uh, I had previous experience with Naomi Bronstein in Bangladesh when I was a visa officer in New Delhi, and we were the visa office responsible for Bangladesh. And Naomi was known for using vast discretion uh, in achieving her objectives. Uh, so we just, you know, hoped for the best and sent them off to Canada. And I have seen recent newspaper clippings, well, recent to me, the last one I think was from the 90s, about, um, about two children in that group that uh, Art Missler, the RCMP officer, ha looked after himself the whole long night. Um, and he's a big strapping six foot four guy and they had these two young, a boy and a girl, brother and sister, who wouldn't let go of him. You know, they, they'd been traumatized and they would not let go of him all night. Um, and he followed them up in Canada and he lives in Richmond, British Columbia, where I live too. And he recently gave me all of his documents and this brother and sister ended up uh, with a family in Oakville, Ontario. And I, uh, the most recent newspaper clippings were from 1991, when they were teenagers, uh, describing how they had adapted and how well they were doing in Canada. So that's what happened to two of them. Um, the rest, uh, you know, Naomi had her troubles with the Ontario uh, Child Welfare Authorities and with their Quebec counterparts over this irregular movement, um, and I, I don't know the, the current status of any but those two. Peter. Uh, sorry, we had a question with someone was waiting here at the microphone. My name's Helene Montgomery, I'm from Kitchener, Waterloo, and as Naomi said, I was a refugee liaison officer and I worked with the uh, first arrival of Hmong people. And I particularly remember um, the case of polygamy. But what I remember, just so that one's image of Mennonite families um, perhaps is more balanced, is that an Amish family was involved in sponsoring one of the Hmong families where there was clearly polygamous. And you could figure that out because of the age of the children. It was virtually impossible that one woman could have every six months had those children. Um, what I remember when one of the sponsors was upset was um, an Amish woman from our community quietly stopping everyone and saying she understood from the family that other Hmong families had found other ways of resolving the problem. And that was that one of them would commit suicide. And she said, with all reference to the Bible, I really feel that the quality of life is what those people who made the decision and suggested that one of them be the aunt is what was valued. And you know, we never in our community had problems with polygamy after that. When we got, there were problems when we went to register them for school because the school board was obviously fairly astute and they could count the number of months as well. And I remember the director of education saying, we really have this problem. And again, it was another Amish woman who said, really, what difference does three months make? 
can't we really just change the birth dates? Do, do you really need them to be that precise? We don't have those, uh, we, we really don't have papers. And so the kind of discretion that you followed in the camp, while those policy concerns were real, continued to be followed in the community. So whether or not it was the school board or other things, suddenly there were accommodations that were made. So that's just a little bit more in terms of that. Good story. Yeah, it was a great story. Great. That's a great story. The, the second is a question, and that is um, a number of us who had worked in war-torn countries were worried about what happened to those refugees who were disabled. And I remember in Kitchener-Waterloo, we had uh, meetings about what was going on with people who, who were disabled, how difficult it was. I have this vague memory that somebody who was overseas was doing work with either Switzerland or, or the Scandinavians, and that we did have the names of people from Kitchener-Waterloo who had been disabled, and somehow got a message to someone overseas that in fact that person, that Switzerland and the Scandinavians were more receptive to doing that. Can you say something about those refugees? Yes, I, I do remember those cases very well um, when we encountered them. Canada's contribution uh, to this larger problem was to take large numbers. That was what we specialized in. Uh, other countries participating uh, did such things as take severely handicapped refugees without any quibble. That was what they were going to do. Sweden was such a country, I believe Switzerland was too. There, there were probably others. I shouldn't malign some of the others. Um, the Japanese did what they did best. They sent large amounts of money. So there were co contributions were not always just in resettling the huge numbers that we did. Uh, and we never, therefore, I mean, we, we had special needs cases that had to go to Canada uh, because of close family connections. But when we encountered other refugees who were clearly going to have a lot of trouble, we just, well, the UNHCR already knew about them. We wouldn't normally have even seen them, but occasionally we did. Uh, but the UNHCR would simply refer it to a country like Sweden that specialized in such cases. We've got time, I think, for a couple more questions. Perhaps um, the two that are standing here. Sorry, no one's at that microphone. Please. No, go ahead. Um, sorry, yes, I was I, I, blinded I, by the light here. Please. I should go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. I, my question is a sort of whatever happened to as well. Um, there were two people that weren't on the in memoriam list today, and they were a young... Um, Lao man who started the um, Lao Association and, and um, also the person who started the Vietnamese Association and the Lao person I found out from someone last night I couldn't remember his name but it was Boon Cha and Tom Vu was the Vietnamese and one t because um, they were given space at the Ontario Welcome House which was a government facility that operated it started at when actually started open when the Ugandan Asians came and carried on from then um, they were given space the three the the Cambodian Lao and Vietnamese associations were given space and they were I was working with them related to grants to hire staff and um, the young man Boon Cha who was the president invited me one time to and I think it was probably a, a Lunar New Year celebration. And I didn't know much about the selection process. I was on the settlement end, and that's what Ontario put a lot of effort into. And when I walked into the room, and I, I remember it as being literally hundreds and hundreds of, of what appeared to me to be teenagers, and mostly men, young men, but a few young women, probably 20%. And I said to him, and he himself, this president of the association was like at the time a student um, at University of Windsor but he'd come into Toronto to work on this and um, he, he was very young I think he was 23 at the time and I said to him these are all teenagers that like how did they get here there are no there are no people here that are that are older there are hundreds of teenagers and he said well a lot of the people that came in, yes, they are teenagers. And he said they're living in apartments 
um, you know, sometimes 10 of them in an apartment. And they, I said, but they should be in school. And he said, but they lied about their age when they came in. So they didn't come in as teenagers. So they're not eligible for school. And I've always thought of that um, experience. And I've always wondered what happened to those young, what were then very young Lao refugees that I saw in that room. I don't know if anyone here knows specifically about that community. Maybe that's something later. I just made a comment about single males. That one of the reasons, one of the impacts that we had in Hong Kong of the TB problem was that you would think you were doing fine. You'd have you know, three brothers, two of them were married, there were um, nuclear families, and then suddenly you discover that somebody's wife's parents were along, and you'd sort of sigh because you could see that tuberculosis problem looming in front of you, and sure enough, you'd find out uh, X weeks later. So taking three guys who were brothers who were 24, 21, and 19, your chances of having a tuberculosis problem um, was much smaller. The tuberculosis issue really drove a lot of selection decisions because aged parents, for us at least in Hong Kong, were a huge problem. And the transit lounge issue, when you started having people backlogged and holding back large sorts of families, meant single males or sing young people generally were much more likely to, uh, to pass medicals. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, just um, a minor comment, well, maybe not that minor, and clarification about the baby flight, because as, as Don said, he, uh, beyond the, the, after the fact, he doesn't know what happened to the 65 Cambodian babies. Uh, I just, by pure chance, I just got, uh, the day before I came here, a copy of a documentary film which was made in 2001 by Telefilm Canada, uh, which is called A Moment in Time, The United Colors of Bronstein. And obviously it is a, a rather elogious film about Naomi Bronstein, who eventually got the Order of Canada and who eventually uh, uh, in recognition of all her, her activities, uh, well, was very highly regarded. She's now semi-forgotten. Having said that, she died in 2010 in Guatemala, having established very major program for, for handicapped children. And uh, according to the movie film, that's all I know, that's all I saw, the 65 Cambodian babies were brought from Phnom Penh virtually on the last flight before uh, the Khmer Rouge marched into, it was a US Air Force flight supposedly that was uh, uh, into, into Phnom Penh. They arrived in Saigon. They talked to uh, Charge d'Affaires, Hébert there. Now Hébert, uh, they were supposed to go out on the Hercules flight that crashed on April the 4th which was a, an enormous, terrible uh, disaster. Uh, Naomi, according to the film again, gave up the places on the Hercules flight because there was a Canadian flight coming in from Hong Kong and there was the possibility of putting them on the Canadian flight. Hebert allowed them on the Canadian flight. Now the claim is made that the reason he allowed them is because he, they were in fact documented. We know that Hebert at the end did not allow any, any Vietnamese out from uh, Vietnam who were not documented, so I don't know where that stands. Then of course, as, as Don had, had described it extremely well, some very heroic activity took place at the Canadian mission in Hong Kong, including very rapid actions, uh, putting them up, the RCMP officer and uh, the fl a flight accompanied by Canadian diplomatic wives, including Sandra Ca Ca Cameron and Liz Hetherington in particular. Uh, and as it happens, this is the final comment, uh, the people are known, they're in the film. There was a reunion of the 65 of them. 
which is very well documented in the film. Uh, and uh, they seem to be virtually all Canadians these days, relatively well established Canadians, professionals, married families, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, just to kind of get a feeling of what happened to people who got out like that, and it was a, you know, they were babies, but somehow placing them in Canada with Canadian families doing that thing appears to have turned out for the most of them. And again, the only evidence I have is the film quite well. That's it. Thank you. Well, I think um, our time is up. I will, if I... If you go to a microphone so we can hear you. And <laughs> Two items. One, in response to some of the things said, if you have names of people who were very involved uh, in the movement, such as Naomi and the Cambodian and the Lao person, if you give them to me, we'll amend the film, the In Memoriam film, because it's going to be used more widely and we'll get another issue out of it. So please give those names to me tonight and I'll get them started the amendment tomorrow. Second item is, if there's garbage in front of you, if you could clean it up, thanks. <laughs> Uh, um, I just, if I can take the, uh, the liberty of having been the chair of this panel, just to make one uh, final comment on, on, on leaving. I think, uh, I suspect that my, all my colleagues at the table, and uh, Dick as well from, uh, from an international organization, look back at the, those couple of years as, you know, probably some of the most uh, impactful experiences in our lives. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we worked extremely hard at the time. We took lots of liberties uh, and did, you know, exercise discretion. But to the point that was made earlier this afternoon about uh, empowering, I think we felt that we were, uh, we were working in an environment where we were empowered to make decisions, that we weren't going to be caught out for doing something wrong. You know, there, wasn't, there wasn't going to be a sort of witch hunt for mistakes, at least certainly in the later part of the program, perhaps at some points in the Saigon ex evacuation would be different. And I think it was a very positive sort of atmosphere. We felt like we were a member of a team, even though some of us had never met each other. Um, we all know each other's telex acronyms. I still remember SPORE, for example, <laughs> you know, these various places. But I think that the question of empowerment of the civil service and the designated class, the ability to have discretion, the ability to move quickly, um, and to not second guess the folks that were on the ground had a huge impact on the success of this, mov this movement. So on behalf of my colleagues today, I'd like to thank you for your interest and your attention, and uh, thank you.